This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. Indeed, he is risen. Happy Resurrection Day, St. Stephen, and to all our guests. I'm just excited to be in the house of the Lord. I'm excited to see you, even though I can't see you. I know it's early, and some of you have been off of work, and you haven't woken up this early now in a few weeks, but we are up for the risen king. And I love that kid when he says, I knew it, I told you that he was going to get up, and uh, just reflecting on the power of the blood. It's just so good to be in the house of the Lord. And I want to open up with a word of prayer so we can just celebrate this day like we have never celebrated before. Shall we pray together? Lord, we're grateful for the risen king. We're grateful for the power of the blood. We're grateful, Lord, that you have blessed us to be able to serve in this medium. We know we're living in some trying times, but I just pray right now that we can compartmentalize, that we can lay every uh, sin and weight uh, that beside us and and just focus in on you, that we just cast our cares upon you because you careth for us and that we can just hear a clear and clear word from you, that we can just pray unto you, Lord, we can just sing unto you, that we can just be set free, that we can know that we are living in the power of the resurrection. Oh God, we do thank you as well for peace that goes past all understanding. We thank you as well for the joy of the Lord being in our strength. And hearts we say thank you we pray lord as we have some time to worship that we would shake off the dust of the struggles and the snares and the issues that are around us we pray this prayer and we thank you in jesus christ's name amen challenge you all to just rest on your feet as you always would you know i already have on the tuxedo ready to roll just for y'all just for the lord and we are ready to celebrate we're going to join in with our outstanding male chorus let's give them a hand of encouragement as they come to us god bless you Oh, come on, put those hands together, y'all. Come on.
give God the praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. One more time, let me hear you. Raise it up, raise it up. Hallelujah. Don't be scared. Again, go. All right, good. Ladies. Sopranos. Not that low, I got gotcha. you. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords, hallelujah. Sing it, lady. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords, hallelujah. Come on. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords, hallelujah. I got gotcha. you. I'll do it again. Come on. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords, hallelujah. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords, hallelujah. Amen. Y'all sound like y'all ready. Men, y'all better step it up. They ready now. such a great job just had to join in with them they're doing outstanding amen praise the lord it's just good to be in the house of worship worshiping the lord and your house is the house of worship uh, i want to start off as we always do with uh, many thanks uh, this past week we had the first drive-through food bank we've been doing a food bank forever but it was the first time we were able to do it as a drive-through and just want you to know it was a tremendous success. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are still so many people in need. The line was just so, so very long, but the people were extremely grateful uh, for the food being given to them. And I'm just grateful for all of our volunteers, starting with Brother Robinson, who champions it, and then Sister Choctaw, who did a lot of logistical planning, as well as Sister Shaw. And so it just really went off as a grand success and just really grateful for all of our partners, Feed America, Los Angeles Regional Food Bank, as well as Servants Arms. Uh, it was just a blessing. So much to the point that even received an email from one of our neighbors that we don't even know that said, I could see the cars, I could see the line, and if there's anything we can do to help, we want to help. And so that's the impact that you're making, St. Stephen. We praise God for it, especially in this COVID-19 era. Uh, it really is a blessing. Uh, we do still have a lot of bereavement in the family, and so we want to be in prayer for these families as they go through bereavement. Uh, Brother McClendon had a sister that passed away and back east, and so we want to be in prayer for him and his family as well. And then Sister Irma McClure also had a brother that passed away uh, as well. And then, of course, I know a lot of you have already heard our very own uh, Sister Ann Murphy passed away as well. And so, you know, it's, it's not the same right now. It's difficult because of the funerals and how things are. So really be in prayer for our families as they go through uh, these seasons, these times of bereavement. And, I, and we know you will. Uh, and speaking of that, you know, we've been talking about uh, adopting a senior. Make sure we're still reaching out to our seniors, loving on them, 
uh, in these critical times, making sure they have the food they need, making sure they're all dialed in electronically, and we know they are. They've been Zooming and streaming and doing all those things, and we praise God for it, but we just want to keep a good eye on them and make sure that they're okay. I uh, also want to say thank you for uh, the Lent commitments. Today you get to finish strong on all the different fasts that you've committed to with the Lord, which is a blessing. Uh, the book club will continue. It would have culminated this week, but we're going to continue pressing forward. And after we finish Deuteronomy this coming Wednesday, we're going to move to the first five books of the New Testament starting next week. So uh, you can still zoom into the book club. Remember, all you got to do is read that book that we are in that current week and then come with some questions and we'll have some discussions. So make sure you're a part of the book club as we can continue to move forward. Uh, also with the Lent Commitments, want to really thank you. We are all the way up to $59,000 in our giving. We will be a debt-free church even with all that's going on. Uh, the Lord is blessing, and we just pray that uh, we will indeed be a debt-free church. And by the year 2020 ending, we will be there. And, and I just thank God for you uh, helping to make that happen. Also remember, we have communion coming up right after this next selection, so make sure you get your elements prepared so that we can uh, break bread and uh, celebrate the death, burial, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as a family as well. And then to our guests who've come by, we just praise God for you being with us electronically, and we're looking forward to when all this is over, uh, we can all come here and worship the Lord physically in spirit and in truth, which is exactly what we want to do. Well, we want to keep traditions alive. Each second Sunday, we take time out to acknowledge those couples that were wedded. And so if you were married in the month of April, you can just stand around your family. You can just let them know that it is me. We got married in this month of April. I know we have some couples that are all up at 49 years and, and beyond that are celebrating this month and some over 50. And we praise God for it. You know I can't sing, but I will say happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Yeah, that's, that's the best I can do, but we really celebrate you. Normally we would hear all the years that you had, just shout it out, and I'll try to hear it, but main thing is, no, we celebrate with you, and we are praying for longevity in your relationships. God bless you. God keep you as our prayer. We're ready to join back in with this outstanding male chorus. They've been blessing our hearts. Give them a hand of encouragement as they come back to us. stand and proclaim that he is Lord and he reigns I will never be ashamed I will say oh say oh I will say oh Come on now.
will, I 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 will bless, bless the Lord, I will sing from my heart, I will never be ashamed, I will. I will stand and proclaim that He is Lord and He reigns. I will never be ashamed. I will. I'm going to read a scripture and have prayer to bless the elements. Uh, the scripture will teach us that each of us should examine ourselves and not drink or eat of this bread unworthily but to make sure that we confess our sins before the Lord, before we partake. The scripture in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, it says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. The Lord, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many do sleep. So once again this week, I have my bread, but this is some good old wheat bread. If you noticed last week, we had a little bit different. Being symbolic of Jesus' body on that night, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he told them, eat ye all of it. Likewise, on that Day, symbolic of his blood. Jesus took the juice, blessed it, and he told them, drink ye all of it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord really is good, and his mercy endureth forever. I'd like for you to take some time now and just enjoy this dramatic presentation through video. God bless you.
just ask you to do as you would do if you were here and stand with your family or go on to your knees or whatever is comfortable or appropriate for your setting. I know you have your outfit on and you got your hair fried, dyed, laid to the side. Everything is good to go, but uh, we ready. we're ready to get into a time of prayer. I want to read a scripture here from Psalm 118, a very familiar passage, and it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say that his mercy endureth forever. Let them now that fear the Lord say that his mercy endureth forever. Here's what we can hold on to. It says, I called upon the Lord in distress, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put our confidence in man. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name that is above every other name. We're grateful for this time that you have allowed us to come together to spend with you in the midst. We pray, Father, as well, that we can hold on to this word that says to give thanks. Regardless of what's going on, give thanks. In the New Testament, it says rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. And Father, we want to rejoice even in this moment uh, the times that we're living in, because this day is the day that symbolizes the morning that you got up with all power in heaven and on earth. It said the stone has been rolled away. And we say thank you, Lord, for being so good to us because you came to see about us. I used to say in old, you walked through 42 generations just to get to us. And Lord, we say thank you. Father, we want to also confess that we've had some missteps. Father, that we've said some wrong things. Father, that we've done some wrong things, and we ask that you would create in us a clean heart and renew the right spirit within. Father, that you would purge us with your hyssop. Father, that you would make us whiter than snow. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be holy and acceptable unto you. Lord, that is what we're striving for on this day. We also want to be intercessors for those that are around us, those that are still caregiving for their families, for those seniors. Lord, that you would look after them in a special way, that you would even watch over the caregivers. As we know, it's not easy trying to give and share and do what you can to make sure the needs of those you love are taken care of. It's easy to feel guilty when you try to take care of yourself because you just want to take care of the others. But I pray that you would be with these caregivers. I pray that you would be with our seniors and keep them safe and secure. They may have hesitation and reservation because of all that's going on but I pray that you give them peace that goes past all understanding of course Lord we do continually pray for those that are working in our grocery stores those that are still delivering our mail those that are working for UPS and FedEx and those that are still working for the phone companies and the cable companies and and all the car companies and all those that work on cars all those people that are considered quote-unquote essential that you would continue to bless them and their families and keeping them safe and secure coming home wondering if they're bringing this virus to their families keep them safe and then Lord of course we pray for those going through bereavement our Lord that can't adequately bring the family together to celebrate lives well lived those that are special to them we pray that you'd be a God of comfort for them and, and give them your special peace as well and be with those that work in the mortuaries who are overtasked and things are different for them as well and Lord there's just so much going on around us of course we pray for our political leaders and Lord we pray for the presidents we pray for the governors we pray for the, mary, the, the mayors and we pray for the supervisors and all those that are making decisions Lord that you give them wisdom and clarity beyond their years and father we know that you will do it and then lord of course we pray now for the preach word that's coming forward that uh, we can hear it in a way that we have never heard before that we can hear it with a thirst and a hunger that moves us towards obedience and application Father, we thank you as well that we can sit and hear your word and apply it. And I pray, Father, that we are all changed as a result of sitting at the feet of the cross and of your word. We pray, Father, as well that you keep back the enemy who we know wants to bring about fear and division and discontentment. 
but greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. And we know we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. So bless and keep as only you can. Oh God, we give you hearty thanks and we do give you all the praise in the strong and powerful name of Jesus Christ and all of God's people said, amen, 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 and God bless you. It truly is a privilege and honor to introduce our speaker of the hour. He is no stranger around St. Stephen. If you've been to St. Stephen a couple days, you know he has been with us. Uh, he is currently serving as the president of Gateway Seminary and doing a phenomenal job there. I, I know he's getting close to 20 years of service there uh, with, the, with the seminary and has a, a, a tremendous bride that serves in so many capacities as well, Sister Ann Orge uh, at their church, uh, New, New Zion. Uh, Mount Zion, excuse me, uh, they serve over there. I know she's a Sunday school teacher and he serves there with uh, Dr. Kennedy and just doing a lot of ministry as well in the community. But I really praise God for their marriage. I praise God for how they are as parents. I praise God what they are to the kingdom, but also praise God for what they are to St. Stephen. Uh, the last time I wore this tuxedo, for those that may remember, it was about a year ago, and we were celebrating our pastor, Dr. E.W. McCall, and I'm just so grateful that Dr. Orge not only uh, made sure that he had some words to say, but that he actually took time out of his schedule, and he flew all the way to Texas to make sure he was physically present to share those words. And so he is special not only to the kingdom, but he's of course special to us here at St. Stephen. A true pulpiteer, you know he's gonna have some humor. Uh, you know he's gonna give a word that we can use that's portable and practical. Uh, and we know that he has a true love for the Lord. So I just like to present to some and introduce to others our very own Dr. Jeff Orge, president of Gateway Seminary. Dr. Orge, come on up and bless us with what the Lord has already blessed you with. Good morning, St. Stephen's. Wherever you are, I'm glad to be here with you this morning in your worship center and having the opportunity to speak to you in your homes. In a few moments, I'm going to direct our attention to the Bible, so why don't you find yours and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, and in a moment, I'll bring our attention to that scripture and talk with you about what it means for us today. As you're turning there to Matthew 28 and organizing yourself for this message, uh, let me echo what Pastor has said and give you greetings from uh, Mount Zion Church of Ontario, where my wife and I are members, our pastor, Dr. Brian Kennedy. Thank you for your partnership with that church over the years and the friendship we share together. And then also, let me just say a very brief word and thank you for your support of Gateway Seminary. Uh, you have supported us in so many ways over the years. Your pastor is a two-time graduate of our school. You've sent many other students our way. You've contributed to us financially, and you've prayed for us, and we're grateful for all of that. The seminary is strong today. We have not canceled any classes. We did convert all of our classes to a live video conference, our other online delivery, which was relatively simple for us because of our longstanding commitment to being on the cutting edge of educational technology. We were able to make that switch over in just a day or two, frankly, and our school has gone on strongly throughout this semester and will continue to do so up through graduation in the next month or so. Thank you for your support and thank you for standing with us in all these ways. Well, it's Resurrection Sunday, and we're here to celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, has come back alive again from the grave. That's what we're here for. But some people, some people aren't so sure that really happened. I want to talk about that a little while this morning. Before I do, though, let me ask you a question. Have you heard of the shed at Dulwich? The shed at Dulwich in 2017 was the hottest restaurant in London, England. It was ranked number one on TripAdvisor. It was the hardest reservation in town to get. The shed at Dulwich. Calls and emails poured in every day asking, can't you squeeze us in for a birthday dinner or a romantic date or for our anniversary celebration? But it never happened. All the calls were ignored or the people, if they did get through, were told to call back because the restaurant was booked solid for six months in advance. Except it was all a lie. 
The reason no one could get a table was there was no restaurant. The business was bogus. The entire thing was an experiment in algorithm manipulation and buzz creation. In other words, it was an internet hoax by a freelance writer named Uba Butler. Mr. Butler turned his South London garden shed into a fine dining restaurant. He bought a burner phone and a domain name, created a website with pictures of delicious looking food, and oh, by the way, he posed those pictures with ingredients like paint, bleach tablets, shaving cream, and get this, even the heel of his foot. He drummed up interest in his imaginary restaurant made in an appointment-only establishment, lying about it all the time and never booking any reservations. But for six months, the Inn at Dulwich was the most popular restaurant that did not exist. Number one on TripAdvisor, but you couldn't get a table. Hoaxes can be funny, like this one, or like so many other things going on right now as con artists and crooks and charlatans try to take advantage of COVID-19, hoaxes can be harmful when people lose their time and their money or even their health to bogus claims. Now, unfortunately, while many of us are celebrating the resurrection today, Millions will ignore it because they believe it's just another hoax of human history. They claim it never happened. And if it did happen, well, they claim it never, that it has no impact for them. So that raises a fair question. Did the resurrection really happen? And if it did, what real difference does it make today? Let's hear the resurrection story. From Matthew chapter 28. Now at St. Stephen's, if you were here with me, you'd all be standing to your feet right now. So if you're in your home now and you'd like to stand, that'll be fine as we hear the word of the Lord and the story of the resurrection. Matthew 28 verse 1 says, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. There was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards were so shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. The angel told the women, don't be afraid because I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead, and indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So, departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, they ran to tell his disciples the news. Just then, Jesus met them and said, greetings. They came up, took hold of his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus told them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. As they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money and told them, Say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this reaches the governor's ears, we'll deal with him and keep you out of trouble. They took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. The eleven disciples traveled to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. May God bless his word now as I attempt to preach it to us this morning. Let's be seated together. As I said, the resurrection is by some considered a great hoax of history. 
And the first objection to the resurrection is actually found in this text. And that is, the disciples stole the body of Jesus. You can find that in verse 13. The Jewish leaders then told the Roman guards to lie about the resurrection and claim his disciples had taken the body while they were sleeping. This, uh, this was risky business for the guards. In the Roman army, when a soldier was assigned to guard a prisoner, the penalty for failure was severe. If a soldier lost a prisoner, the soldier took that prisoner's place and served out their sentence. If he lost a very important person, the soldier might pay with his life. It was a motivating penalty that caused the guards to be vigilant. The Jewish authorities promised to protect these guards and keep them from responsibility for losing the body of Jesus. So they lied and offered their first bogus attempt to explain the resurrection of Jesus. Now this plan this plan was flawed in several ways. First, <laughs> sleeping men cannot give eyewitness testimony of what, they, of what happened while they were asleep. The priests and the elders told the soldiers, you see it in verse 13, say his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. How ridiculous would this testimony be? Well, sir, I was asleep and I saw the whole thing. I saw clearly the disciples Jesus, taking Jesus' body. Now think how ridiculous that really is. Suppose you have a teenage son and you tell him to watch his little brother and his little sister while you go to the store. You come back. The brother and sister are bloody and bruised. The boy you left in charge, he's asleep on the couch. You wake him up and you say, what happened while I was gone? And he says... I was asleep, but I saw the whole thing. You would not accept that testimony from your sleeping son. The same thing is true in this story. How can sleeping men give eyewitness testimony of what they saw? It's ridiculous on the surface. But second, sleeping men would also admit their dereliction of duty by confessing they were asleep. A better lie would be, well, sir, uh, we were deceived by a false attack and Jesus' disciples stole his body from the tomb. Now, admitting they were asleep would have only compounded their problem and made their lie more laughable. In reality, these guards were not asleep. The Bible indicates they were in shock. It says in verse, tw in verse 4, after seeing the angel and the experience of the resurrection, they were like dead men in a catatonic trance, in shock, unable to really function because of what they had seen. The earthquake, the stone moved, an angel appearing, it had left them like dead men. They definitely knew something had happened. Jesus was resurrected. They had seen it firsthand along with the miraculous events that preceded and went along with the resurrection. These guards were so sure of what had happened, the Jewish leaders could not risk them telling their story to anyone. So the first lies were told about the resurrection to try to conceal what really happened. But that's just the first set of lies. Others have been suggested down through history. A second objection to the resurrection was that the Roman or Jewish authorities stole the body of Jesus. Now this actually makes more sense on one level since they could have dismissed the soldiers guarding the tomb on some pretext and then taken the body. But subsequent actions by these authorities demonstrate that is not what happened. If the authorities had taken Jesus' body, they could have produced that body at any time to debunk the supposed myth of the resurrection. This would have stopped the Christian movement in its tracks. Just imagine people preaching the resurrected Jesus, but then the Romans or the Jewish authorities producing the body of Jesus. It would have ended our movement forever. The first Christians, however, were adamant the resurrection happened. Their faith and beliefs 
and message rested on the reality of the resurrection. If these Romans or these Jewish leaders would have wanted to stop all of that, all they had to do was produce the body of Jesus that they supposedly had taken. Yet, they couldn't do this. Why not? <laughs> because they did not have the body. They would have had to coerce so many people to lie for them and then convince everyone that this supposed body they could have supposedly produced really was Jesus. And my friends, frankly, that's an implausible impossibility. A third objection to the resurrection. Some have postulated the disciples must have looked in the wrong tomb. Well, this stretches the bounds of common sense and reasoning. First, it's inconceivable that Joseph of Arimathea would have forgotten the location of the tomb he had purchased, owned, and then donated as the burial place of Jesus. You can find that story in the previous chapter of Matthew. Listen, most people who purchase a burial plot know where it is. Second, most people who actually bury a loved one remember where that happened. Now, while ancient cemeteries are often lost, that process takes a few centuries, not a few days. We know where our loved ones are buried. For example, I can take you to my mother's grave in Texas. I do not need a map. I can take you to that place because her burial meant much to me. I will not forget the location of that tomb. Third, uh, the authorities posted the guards, so they certainly knew the location of the tomb. Elsewise, how could they have known where to place the guards? Once again, all they had to do was go to the right tomb and produce the right body out of the right location, and all of this resurrection talk could have stopped. Listen, trying to explain away the resurrection by claiming the disciples went to the wrong tomb after three days is ridiculous. When someone we love is buried, we know the location of the grave. When we purchase a burial plot, we know where it's located. When we assign someone to guard or otherwise mark the place of a burial, that generally indicates we know who was buried there. There is no confusion about the true burial place of Jesus. A fourth objection to the resurrection is that Jesus did not really die. He just, what some people say, swooned. This means he lost consciousness and may have appeared dead, but he didn't really die. Well, this theory agrees that Jesus exited the grave, but only as his resuscitated self not his resurrected self. Now the first problem with this theory is it ignores the skill the Romans had at killing people by crucifixion. To put it bluntly, they knew how to do the job. They knew how to crucify a person, allowing them to die a torturous death by suffocation. They were not known for botching this method of capital punishment. The second problem is what Jesus accomplished after he was resurrected. If he was only resuscitated, he would have been limited by his injuries and his, to his badly damaged body. Now think about it. He had been beaten, scourged, crucified, and then survived three days without food or water. And yet he came out and did supernatural events. Not possible for a person who's only resuscitated. Jesus was resurrected. He really died. He was really crucified. He did not swoon. He died a complete and horrible death only to be resurrected three days later. Well, finally, the fifth objection to the resurrection is it was a mass hallucination by his followers. His followers wanted him to be alive so badly they imagined the resurrection. Now this is still believed 
by many people today who say, quote, Jesus is only resurrected in the hearts of his followers. Listen, Jesus' resurrection was a historical reality, not a mass spiritual delusion. The resurrected Jesus was seen by more than 500 people. You can find record of that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. And it was reported in secular writings of the same time period. Now listen, it is possible, it is possible to get a few people to believe and testify about a lie. It is impossible to get hundreds of people to stick to the same story. The reason so many people shared the same testimony is they were telling the truth. Another reason this theory is bogus is because of the selfless service and the martyrdom of early Christians. Listen, my friend. People will sacrifice and even die for the truth. They will not make the same choices for a lie or even an inconsequential truth. The resurrection of Jesus really happened. And we know that because people were willing to die to share that message. They staked their lives on the reality of the resurrection. Now while these are primary objections to the resurrection that have been raised in Scripture and throughout history, what is the overwhelming evidence for the resurrection? Well... We can establish the resurrection as a historical fact by using the same simple methodology we use on other historical records. Whether it's Washington crossing the Delaware or Lincoln being assassinated, historians determine the actuality of events based on the reliability of eyewitness accounts and the reliability of the documents that record those accounts. To validate the resurrection, then we must consider the reality of the New Testament witnesses and the New Testament as a historical document. Well, now you're thinking, I'm about to turn into a seminary president right before your eyes. But not today. Yes, if we were in a seminary classroom, we could spend a great deal of time on the evidence of the New Testament's documents for the resurrection. But since we're in church this morning, let me give it to you in summary form. The historicity of the New Testament based on the eyewitness accounts of its creators is beyond serious debate. Even secular scholars who reject the truth of the New Testament do not reject the actuality or the reality of it as a historical document. Secular and religious scholars generally recognize the New Testament as one of the best preserved and most clearly substantiated documents from the ancient world. We are confident our Bible today is an accurate record of Jesus' resurrection and the early Christian movement that resulted. Now from our New Testament, we could consider four key facts which based on your response to these facts might help determine your acceptance of the resurrection. First, Jesus was buried. Second, his tomb was later found. Third, his tomb was later found empty. There were multiple people who saw his resurrection. And finally, and most importantly for the rest of this message, his disciples zealously spread his message after his death. And so, while we could spend considerable time talking about the documents... I want to spend more time this morning talking about the people and how they lived after experiencing the resurrection. We could spend a lot of time on the first, but today, most of our time on the second aspect of this, mess, of this, of this evidence. So the first people who discovered the resurrection were women who went to the tomb. Some are named in the Bible, Mary. Mary Magdalene, and then it just simply says, some other unnamed women. An angel informed them that Jesus was alive again, and they were to tell the disciples this very good news. 
One way, on the way to do that, Jesus gave them some further directives. He told them to tell the disciples to go on to Galilee. Now, what was the response of these women? Well, the Bible says they had, quote, great joy. And when they saw Jesus, the Bible says, quote, they took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, changed them forever. Now, this detail that the women were the most first and most important witnesses could have been a reluctant fact for the gospel writers to record. You see, in those days, women's testimony was considered worthless. But all four gospels tell this part of the story. If the writers were creating a strong fictional narrative designed to convince people in their day of the reality of the resurrection, they would not have included women as the first and most important witnesses. This further underscores the authenticity of the story. They were trying to tell the truth, not perpetuate a hoax or support a myth. They were reporting facts, not some fanciful tale to support a religious movement. Well, the next people mentioned were the disciples, likely meaning the 11 left over from the original group of those Jesus had chosen to work most closely with him. Now, when they met up with Jesus in Galilee, he gave them some instructions. Now, we commonly call these instructions the Great Commission. Let's read it again. Jesus told them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. We know from their subsequent activities how much this commission changed them. Every one of these 11 men devoted their lives to telling the story of Jesus, including the story of the resurrected Jesus. They had no doubt Jesus had been resurrected. They had seen him. They had heard his voice. They had been transformed by the encounter. They had received their instructions and they were profoundly impacted such that they devoted the rest of their lives to living out the instructions we call the Great Commission. But beyond today's text, there are many other characters in the Bible who believed in the resurrection and were transformed by its teaching. Men like Paul and Stephen changed history by their sacrificial service. Their stories are told in the Bible as examples of how men uh, had their lives changed and how people followed Jesus because of the resurrection. And then Peter, excuse me, Paul later influenced men like Timothy and Titus who became the next generation of church leaders. Now while these men, Timothy and Titus, had not seen the resurrected Jesus, the message was so profound, it impacted them such that they gave their lives to become Jesus' followers and to spread the message of the resurrection. Thus, the power of the resurrection impacted not only the persons who saw the resurrected Jesus, but then a next generation who heard about the, the resurrected Jesus, and then another generation that heard about the resurrected Jesus from them. I'm telling you, even in the Bible, we see a generational transfer of the truth of the resurrection and its power and impact to continue to change lives, motivate ministry, and direct the church forward to accomplish the Great Commission. Listen, these early Christians lived zealously for the mission prompted by the resurrection. They did this in at least a couple of ways. First, they gave sacrificial service to other believers and to other communities because Jesus had told them to live this way. They followed his instructions because his resurrection validated everything he had taught them. 
Jesus' resurrection was like a huge seal of approval that was stamped on everything he'd ever said about life, about family, about money, about relationships. Everything Jesus had taught was validated by the giant seal of approval that was the resurrection. Paul recognized this when he later wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. In other words, everything we preach and everything we believe, if there's no resurrection, none of it matters. But turn it to the positive. Everything we preach and everything we believe, if there is a resurrection, it's all true. The great validation of the resurrection. The resurrection also confirmed that eternal life is possible. The Bible says, And if Christ has not been raised, those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, and 19. In all these ways, the resurrection's de resurrection determined the way early believers lived, and it still does this for us today. Our proclamation, our faith, and even what we believe about death is determined by the resurrection. And let me just say this about the world we're living in right now. More people are talking about death and dying in the culture today than at any time in my lifetime. We have the opportunity as Christians to be different about this issue. Yes, we take seriously the medical threat that is in our country and in our, in our world today. We don't minimize or diminish that when we say we have no fear of it. Because all that disease can do to us is usher us through the doorway of death into the presence of the resurrected Jesus. And because we believe in the resurrection, we have confidence that we have conquered death. And with Jesus, we will come through death victorious and enjoy heaven forever with him. The resurrection validates all of that. And then one other thought, and that is the many believe, early believers, because of the resurrection, were willing to die for their faith. What would motivate a person like Stephen to, ex to endure stoning? He believed in the resurrected Jesus. And in the moment of his death was comforted by the living Christ. Stephen shouted in Acts 7, 56, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. S Stephen was willing to give his life and in fact found the strength and courage to be martyred for his faith because he believed in and actually saw the resurrected Lord. Listen, the belief in the resurrection explains why so many believers in the New Testament and down throughout history have been willing to die for their faith. They believed a life-changing message. They had experienced a life-transforming gospel. They knew the resurrection assured them eternal life. If they lived, they could testify about the resurrection. But if they died, they knew they would be resurrected to eternal life. People do not live and they will not die to preserve a myth or a lie. They will only die a dying martyr's death, only die for life-changing truth that is worth giving their lives for. The willingness of early Christians, Christians throughout history, and even Christians today to give their lives for the message of the resurrection validates the reality that Jesus Christ is alive. Well, in light of all of this, another good question is how much proof do you really need to believe in the resurrection? Well, 
uh, another story in the Bible in John chapter 11 about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead might help us answer this question. Would seeing a dead man come back to life be enough for you to believe in Jesus? How many people, or excuse me, many people believed when they saw Lazarus come alive? But the Bible also says in John eleven forty six, 46, quote, but some refused to believe. And as a result, they stirred up strife with the Pharisees. Now, let's understand what happened. Lazarus died. Jesus called him back alive. Some people saw that and believed. But some, standing in the presence of a dead man, come back alive. Some still refused to believe in the power of Jesus. So much so that they turned to the Pharisees, the religious leaders of their day, to stir up strife against Jesus. Interestingly enough, the Pharisees did not doubt these witnesses. They believed that Lazarus had come back from the dead. But they, instead of accepting that and allowing it to change them, begin to plot and ask themselves this question from John eleven forty seven: 47. What are we going to do with this man who is doing so many signs like calling a man back from the dead? The Pharisees saw the miracles Jesus was doing. And those who reported to the Pharisees saw these same wonders. Yet, they refused to believe in and follow Jesus. In the face of undeniable evidence, a dead man walking, people still refused to believe in Jesus. Well, are you like the Pharisees and their followers? Are you demanding proof of the resurrection yet when it is presented, as I've done this morning, you still refuse to believe? My friend, how much proof do you really need? Is an empty tomb enough proof? <laughs> How about meeting a terrifying angel that rolled away a stone? How about seeing the resurrected Jesus himself? In the last chapter of Matthew that I've read a few moments ago, people experienced all of these things. They saw the empty tomb. They heard from and met an angel. They experienced the resurrected Jesus. Yet, still, people had very different responses. The empty tomb and the soldier's report were not enough for the high priest. The angel rolling away the tomb did not convince the soldiers. And even for some of the disciples, the resurrected Jesus did not remove all their doubts. But, as we've already read about those women, they worshipped him anyway. Now some of you this morning have absolute certainty in your mind of Jesus' resurrection. But some others of you may doubt that it really happened. The characters in the account in Matthew teach us two important principles that will help you this morning. First, Factual data by itself does not produce faith in Jesus. You cannot be argued into belief. Second, having some doubt by itself does not preclude you still worshiping the resurrected Jesus. Now that surprises some people. But in reality, 
most of us always struggle with a little doubt mixed into our faith. Jesus addressed this issue of how doubt and faith are often mixed. In the story where Peter walked on the water, remember that one? Jesus rescued Peter when he began to sink and asked, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, Jesus' words were a corrective, no doubt. But they also teach us something else. And that is, even if we have doubts from time to time, that does not mean our faith is not real. Remember, before Peter's doubts caused him to sink, his faith motivated him to get out of the boat. Jesus often speaks of people who have little faith. In Matthew 6, verse 30, Jesus said, If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do so much more for you, you of little faith? Matthew 8, 26, Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? faith. Matthew 14, 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him to Peter and said, you have little faith. And then Matthew 16, verse 8, aware of this, Jesus said, you of little faith. Repeatedly, Jesus addresses the issue of people having a little faith. Listen, little faith is not a badge of honor, but neither, neither does it disqualify someone from being a true follower of Jesus. Now, you've heard objections to and evidence for the resurrection, and I've challenged you to, in the context of all of that, in the midst of what may be a little bit of doubt, reaffirm your faith this morning in the reality of the resurrection. And as you do so, may I conclude with these personal challenges for you today? First, as a result of this message today, I hope you will affirm the resurrection really happened. Look, we're not here today, <laughs> we are not here today celebrating some ancient religious myth or some urge, urban legend or some centuries-old hoax. We got up early this morning because we really believe Jesus was raised from the dead. We accept the historical reality of the resurrection. We are as sure that Jesus was raised from the dead as we are that Nero lived in the first century and Roosevelt in the last one. Eyewitness accounts and historical records validate these true events. Listen, the resurrection of Jesus meets all reasonable criteria for being a demonstrable historic event. We declare the resurrection really happened. And we affirm it as the most amazing event in human history. Then second, I want you to allow the power of the resurrection to change you this morning. The resurrection interprets and validates the life and the teachings of Jesus. Jesus can change your life today. This Easter can be more than a day to dress nicely, Go to online church with your friends or family or have a big meal afterwards. This can be a day when Jesus changes you. If you'll confess your sins, commit your life to Jesus as Lord, and believe that God raised him from the dead, he promises to give you the gift of salvation. If you will turn from living for yourself and determine to live for Him, He will change your life today and give you new life forever. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and see, the new has come. You can start over today with a brand new life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you're afraid of dying today, If you're aging and concerned about that, if you face a series of health struggles or difficulties, you're concerned about that, or if you're a person of relatively good health and you're fearful of COVID-19 striking you down randomly, you can be delivered from those fears today. 
You can be delivered from those fears because Jesus Christ conquered death. And because he conquered death, he conquers death in your life and will give you eternal life with him. The Bible says in Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. You will someday die just like Jesus died. But you will someday die be resurrected to new life forever in eternity in heaven with him because Jesus Christ was resurrected. You do not have to fear death any longer. Death is not your master. It's not over you. It doesn't control you. It's not the end of life for you. It's just a portal for you to have the eternal life that's been promised to you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then finally, I want you to accept your role in the mission inspired by the resurrection. You are living for something. And you will die for something. Will it be a larger house? Nicer car? More expensive wardrobe? Will you live for your job? Your career? Your achievements? Will you live even for your family or for your friends? All of these things are important. And in their proper context, they have value. But listen now, none of these things, not your house, your car, your wardrobe, not your job, your career, or your achievements, and not even your family or your friends, not one of these things is worth sacrificing your life. Only Jesus is worthy of that kind of sacrifice. The only message worth that kind of sacrifice is the message of the resurrection. When you focus on sharing that message, you give other people the means to meaningful life now and eternal life when they die. When your life is devoted to the resurrection, you will obey Jesus and what he taught in every area of life. When you recognize the resurrection was the most important moment in human history, it becomes the focal point of your personal history. You will sacrifice your time, your energy, your influence, your money, your resources, your time, your talents. You will sacrifice it all for the message that really matters, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. After his resurrection, Jesus gave his disciples the instructions we call the Great Commission. They were applicable for those 11 who heard it that first time. They are equally applicable to us today. The resurrection's marching orders are the Great Commission of Jesus to take his message the message of his life, the message of his death, and most of all, the message of his resurrection to the whole world. St. Stephen's, that is your mission. That is your responsibility. And that is what I call you to this morning as we celebrate the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, and God bless you for letting me be your guest this morning. We can all say praise the Lord and hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, for that powerful word. Let's give Dr. Orge a hand of encouragement for blessing our hearts this morning. Uh, really a challenging word on so many different levels uh, to inspire and encourage us. But first to the non-believer, that person that hasn't accepted Jesus Christ, this Resurrection Day being all about that, fears that we have. And the, the Bible is so clearly saying God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of doubt in the world today, but he had comfort in this word that he spoke from. And if you ex haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, that's what this moment is all about. That's what this Lenten season, that's what the, this Holy Week, whether it's Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, all of it is about you getting to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe I don't need that. Maybe I'm, I'm doing pretty good. But the scripture says all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of those sins is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And you heard Dr. Orr, he, he laid it out. He says, well, well, what do I need to do to make this happen? Romans 10 and 9 just simply says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, he said, you will be saved. You shall be saved. And of course, that 13th verse says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Even though we were enemies to him, even though we were hostile against him, he still died for us. Christ died for the person that was nailing the cross or nailing into his hand, nailing him to that cross. He died for that person. The person that was pressing down the crown of thorns, he died for that person that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That is the gift for you. And we know in Revelation it says, I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking, I'm trying to come in. Today would be a great day, Resurrection Sunday, to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But the challenge didn't stop there. He wasn't just challenging non-believers. He even came to us as the believer. And he had us look and see, are we living with doubt? Are we living with fear? And he said, yeah, maybe we do have a measure of doubt in there. But even Peter, he had enough faith to still get out and to actually walk on that water. Yes, doubt does keep in, creep in about COVID-19. Doubt does creep in about your parenting. Doubt does creep in about the work and the finance and, and the health issues. All of those things, doubt does creep in. But do we also believe in the power of the resurrection? Are we also comfortable in knowing that God has said, listen, death is just a doorway, something that we're just going to pass through on our way to glory. That's all it is. But then he talked about the application of how we live since we've been resurrected. And I pray that all of us, as we go through this and are in these times where the Lord kind of has us in exile from our church buildings and, and our freedoms that we like to have and going out and doing what we enjoy doing, that even in these moments that we hear from him and see what he's trying to do in and through our lives, that when we talk to someone in the grocery store, that we are salt and that we are light, that we are a source of encouragement. If you've accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, then I encourage you to shoot me an email, send me an email, give a phone call, whatever the case may be, so that we can reach back to you this week and talk to you more, disciple you adequately, and get you as a part of the body of Christ here at St. Stephen. Uh, but send me an email as well so that we can know this and we can send you all the literature that you will need to help you move forward in your journey. And we just want to pray a, a blessing on all of you as you move forward in your faith and that we are living in some trying times, but we always are because the enemy is always present doing what he can. So, Lord, we do pray for those that are right now on the fence as to whether or not they want to accept you as Lord and Savior, that today indeed would be the day of salvation. For you said for us not to harden our hearts such as in the day of provocation. And then, Lord, we pray for those of us that are believers, Lord, that there is a, a source of, of and a sense of intimacy like no other time in our lives. Father, that we walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called with all lowliness, and we know that you will do it. Set the captive free today and bless and keep. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I want to join back in get one more song with our outstanding male chorus, Give them a hand of encouragement as they come and bless our hearts one more time. For God, always ask. And I know you have a little trouble in your mind now. And things are not going right. But talk to God. He will see you through. Talk to him. Have a personal conversation with God about what's on your mind. i 
on, join and sing with us. Make me over again, Lord. you want to do in my life Lord make me over again praise God again for the word and we just want to thank Dr. Ors for coming out early in the morning so early to come and bless our hearts with a powerful word from God and and all of the choir singing male chorus we praise God for them and just blessing our hearts this resurrection Sunday it truly is a blessing and now we're ready to zoom into our Sunday school because we are not Christian cool unless we Go to Sunday school. So that's exactly where we want to go now. A great lesson dealing with the temptation of Jesus Christ. And so make sure you tell your friends, relatives, neighbors, send them the Zoom link so that uh, people can come in from all over the world to be a part of those Sunday school classes. And we know that's been happening. Let's rest on our feet together for our benediction and just praise God for you on this resurrection day. And I praying for all the food that you're going to have, that it's a great time of fellowship as well and celebration with the Lord. And again, uh, if you fasted from uh, meats and different things, make sure you ease in. Don't try to eat too much. Uh, you know, we don't want anybody getting ill because they've been fasting from meats and sweets and all those things, and they rush right in right now. So, you know, we want to step in slowly. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for being so good to us. We thank you for loving us. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus Christ. We're grateful for his obedience all the way to the cross, and we're grateful for the power of the resurrection. We're grateful, Lord, for a healing that you have brought to our lives and how you have made us one with you once again. 
And Father, we just pray as we move forward, as we continue to live in a way that honors you, Father, that you continue to bless and use us to be instruments of your righteousness. Lord, we do want to be salt. We do want to be light. We do want to be that city that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid. Father, we want to be about the Father's business, just like your son said. So help us to do that. Lord, we understand the importance of seeking and saving that which is lost and discipling those that are found. We want to be God's servant in God's service, serving God's people. All those things we strive to do. So bless and keep as we move forward. I pray for each household that you hold them, that you keep them, that you preserve them, give them good health, and give them good strength. Bless us as we go into the Sunday school hour. Bless our Spanish language service that's about to take off as well at 8 o'clock. And then, Lord, as well as the Easter program at 9.30. And then, Lord, we come back for 11, and we're looking forward to it all. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, be glory, majesty, dominion, power. And the whole church of God said, amen, amen. God bless you. God keep you. You know we love you, St. Stephen. Looking forward to seeing you in the Zoom. God bless you. Amen. <laughs>